Um, right, so let's get started, everybody. Welcome to uh, our webinar today. We are going to be talking about best practices uh, for live chat, and that kind of covers a wide range of uh, areas in which you can dive in on. Uh, we're going to try to touch most of those areas today. Team organization, expectations, technical rollout implementation, um, anything and anything, anything and everything in between. Um, but we've got two great panelists, three if you want to count me. I'm going to try to just keep the conversation moving along more than anything else today. Um, but my name is Carl Paulo. It's I am the head of communications over at Olark Live Chat. Joining us today is Matt Patterson, who is customer service evangelist for Help Scout, and Denise Chum, who is the head of customer support at Isu. Did I actually did I get your company name right too? <laughs> issue. It's issue. Just gotcha. like a regular. They just wanted to be fancy with a spelling. <laughs> <laughs> Denise of Issue. It's spelled I S S U U. If you want to look it up online. Um, anyways, we all have uh, a lot of. Um, customer support experience and also experience when it comes to live chat. So we got a lot of, a lot of ground to cover today. Um, I did want to do two quick um, housekeeping things before we dive into the conversation. One is uh, if anybody here is joining us on social media today, um, if you want to shout out anything that you're hearing during the conversation, or if you want to ask questions via Twitter, uh, we're also taking a look at Twitter and keeping an eye there. So if you'd rather ask questions there, you're welcome to do that. You can tag your questions or your comments with hashtag live chat tips. Um, and if you want to shout out any of our companies, uh, you can do at Olark, O-L-A-R-K, at Help Scout, all one word, H-E-L-P-S-C-O-U-T, and at Issue, at I-S-S-U-U. So um, the other housekeeping bit that I wanted to cover off on real quick, and then we'll dive in. Um, two things to let you know about, first of which is um, there is a new Olark live chat and uh, Help Scout integration, integration that's available um, that lets you share information between those two platforms. If you'd like to know more, any more about that, um, you're welcome to email myself or Matt uh, when the webinar finishes up. We'll give our email addresses at the end of this. We'd be happy to talk you through more of that. And I also wanted to mention that there's a new uh, salary survey that's being done in conjunction with Help Scout and the support driven community. And uh, the survey is asking, getting some more information on different uh, salaries, compensation levels that are being offered throughout the industry. If you'd like to participate in that, or if you'd like to sign up to receive that survey once uh, the survey results, once they're available, um, please get in touch with Matt. He'd be happy to direct you to the right place to either sign up or get on the list for distribution uh, when that is available. So that concludes our housekeeping portion of the presentation. Let's get into the content. Um, let's kick off. Uh, Denise, uh, I'd like to, I'm going to send this over to you first. I want you to, could you just tell the group a little bit about yourself, maybe a little bit about your background, uh, what's the quick rundown on your on issue and what you guys do, um, and maybe some insight on how long you've been in support and service, um, and maybe one fun fact about yourself as well. <laughs> sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Denise. I currently run the customer support team at Issue. My background is actually pretty... Um, odd. I have a bachelor's in biology and women's studies and I thought I was going to be a doctor or work in public health in a developing country. Uh, but I ended up uh, in Silicon Valley because my husband works as a software engineer and so I decided to find a job here and most of the companies here are tech companies. Um, the most interesting part of it is that because I did qualitative research in international health, those skills are actually pretty transferable to customer support because you're having to do research into your customers' problems. You're going to have to apply the listening and empathy skills in order to work with them to find a solution. So the shift was not as drastic as I thought it would be, and I've been doing this for five years now. Um, Issue is a digital publishing platform that started in Denmark about 10 years ago. It's We call it the best uh, well-known secret because a lot of people in Silicon Valley don't know Issue, but then I bump into people from all over the US and especially Europe and they're using Issue to host digital versions of their publications. So we have companies using us to host their internal newsletters of companies. We have a lot of catalog companies that use us to host their catalogs in order to reduce their global uh, footprint. We have universities using us for all their admission brochures and departmental notices. I mean, we have a lot. I mean, I think we have about 30 million publications on our website, so it's pretty fun here. One fun fact about me. <laughs> I'm originally from Ghana, and I love languages, so I have beginner fluency in Hindi, 
and I've been studying Korean for two years. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Love it. Thank you, Denise. Appreciate it. Um, Matt, same questions over to you. Could you give us a quick introduction on who you are, uh, what Help Scout is, uh, how you got into this field, and maybe a fun fact about yourself? Sure. So, yes, I'm Matt. I work for Help Scout, which is it's an amazing team of people. We make um, customer service tools like Help Desk, which is called Help Scout 2, and a knowledge base um, and a little beacon you know, to connect you with your customers, basically. And my role is really um, talking about customer service and um, educating. And you can see a blog post that I put up today, uh, kind of model answers for helping people understand how to think about difficult conversations. So that kind of thing. And uh, we're just trying to raise the, elevate the role of customer service, I guess, which is part of what we're doing here too. Um, before I joined Help Scout, I spent uh, almost 10 years at Campaign Monitor, which was a, it's an email marketing software company based in Sydney. And I joined that company when there was only four of us. And I was the very first customer service person and I was in customer service leadership role there, building that up from just me to uh, 27 something people in support uh, by the time I left there. Uh, so I have lots of thoughts and feelings about customer service. Uh, fun fact, this, uh, I can't point this way, this typewriter here behind mm -hmm. me, um, that belonged to my grandfather. He used that for 50 years or so, still got the original instruction booklet with it. Uh, and he used to type everything, including like birthday cards. So every year, you get a birthday <laughs> card typed out on the typewriter, dear old Matthew, every year. Uh, even though I live next door to him and he could have just, <laughs> and he would typewriter. So it's pretty awesome. That's an amazing family heirloom. That's, that's really nice. Um, and hey, everybody, my name is Carl. Um, I work for a company called Olark Live Chat. Uh, we make a live chat widget for your website. So if you'd like to talk to your customers, we, we've made a platform that we feel is pretty easy to get implemented on your site. Um, we, uh, my background is I've actually been kind of on the marketing side of things for a few years um, since coming to Olark and participating in our all hands support uh, system. I've also kind of expanded some of what I do to, to provide some support shifts, customer service shifts, as well as uh, customer support over social media. Um, try to do my best to contribute where I can, uh, but uh, uh, certainly there are, we have a, a dedicated team of support professionals here who are, are amazing at what they do um, and are always available on chat. Um, Olark has been around for a couple of years now, based in San Francisco here. Um, and one uh, fun fact about me is uh, I used to play travel kickball. So uh, for those who might not be in the United States, it's a variation of baseball, but you roll a bouncy ball in and kick it with your foot instead of hitting it with a bat. And uh, I, as an adult, we traveled the country and played and played for a few years. So that's me. <laughs> Um, cool. So well, I, uh, I had to Google that yesterday to find out what that was. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, you know, it, it was fun. It kept me young for a few more years and, uh, that I appreciated. Um, cool. So let's, let's dive in and, and real quick for everybody who's joining us again, if you want to ask any questions as we go along here, which I see we have a question from Adam, uh, we'll be using the chat button at the bottom of your zoom dashboard to ask those questions. So go ahead and ask those whenever you have them. And when we find the right time for them. We won't be stopping for the like dedicated Q&A sessions. We'll just try to take questions as they come in, uh, except for yours, Adam. We're going to actually dive in with an initial question, then we'll get to your uh, tips on best ways to scale live chat. That's actually a topic coming up in what we have planned. So we'll, we'll definitely get to that. Um, so I guess I want to, Matt, I guess I was going to start with you. Um, could you maybe, for perspective here in our conversation, could you give us a quick rundown of, of the, uh, the channels that your company is using for support and maybe uh, an idea of what your team size is? So the, the Help Scout support team is five people here. Um, and it's primarily email support that historically has been all of the support is done that way. Um, you know, a few outgoing phone calls when it's necessary. Uh, but we have started using chat um, in a couple of different ways, trialing it out. And we're going to, I think we'll probably, this will come up in conversations too, but because it's a small team and to Adam's point, like it's very difficult to open it way up when you're in a, a company that has, you know, a very large number of customers compared to the number of team that you have. Um, so we're using a chat here in a, in a particular context, narrowed it down to people who are actively trialing out Help Scout products. So while you're in that trial period, you have access to chat, which is the time when you probably have the most questions and you need 
you want a quick answer to figure out like, is this right for me? How's it going to work? What do I need to do to set it up? So we've, uh, we're really targeting the chat at that place and it seems to be really helpful in that context for us. Excellent. Perfect. Um, and Matt, sorry if I missed this. What's, what's the team size there? I mean, how, how many people are on your team uh, helping customers over those different channels? So just to be clear, it's not my team. Justin, okay, Justin runs, uh, yeah, yeah. That's a good, uh, shout out to Justin. He runs that team. So there's five of them. Uh, so there's someone here in Australia with me, Kelly. Uh, and then we have, uh, you know, a European support person and a, and a few in, in the US. Uh, and that's covering uh, seven days a week, essentially. You know, a little bit less on the, on the weekends. Got it. Denise, could you give us maybe the same kind of rundown? What channels are you using for support and service and how big is your team? Or is sure. the team there? <laughs> sure. Um, there are six members of the team, but two are part-time. So we only have four members. Out of the four, I'm one. And because I'm the team lead, I'm not really on um, support most of the time. So we have three full-time members who are all in Denmark and I am here in the US. So we also have a bit of a split, um, just like the Health Scout team does. So that gets a little challenging, just like to Emily's question, and we will address that too as well, about how to respond when you're a global company with uh, customers in different time zones, and your team is also in different time zones. Yeah. Excellent, perfect. Um, and then here at Olark, we, have, uh, we offer email support, but primarily we do our customer support and service over live chat. Uh, during certain hours of the day, I believe right now we're doing um, five days a week for uh, 9 a.m. to uh, 10 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and then the off hours, off hour questions are answered usually within a few hours uh, over email. Uh, we have um, two, two sort of teams where we have a frontline team, but we also have a triage team. So we have a frontline team that is mostly on chat and on email. We also have a, a triage team behind them with maybe they're ready to jump in on more technical engineering questions uh, when people need help. And um, gosh, I, I think our exact number is somewhere in the nine to 10 people range fully dedicated to support starting over in Scotland and then moving across over into San Francisco. Um, but we have everybody in the company help out uh, with at least one customer support shift a month. Uh, all hand support is what we call that and we just, um, make sure that everybody has a chance to help customers um, answer questions, stay close to their feedback, that sort of thing. Um, now, Denise, I know your team, uh, when we were talking before this webinar got started, it sounds like your team is considering putting some thought behind live chat as a channel uh, for your website. Can, can you talk a little bit about what, uh, what, if any experience you have with chat already, and then what kind of prompted this um, new process to start looking at it again for issue. Sure. Um, one of the things that I've noticed um, as the team lead, and just to preface, we are the support team, but we actually handle all pre-sales through to completion. So we don't have a dedicated sales team. And based on the nature of our products, we deal with billing questions, pre-sales, you know, inquiries. We, we have content publications on our site. So we deal with copyright takedowns as well, as well as technical issues that require us to pull some developers in. So it runs the gamut. And so I noticed that we are having all these pre-sales questions that could be answered in a short amount of time, but are lagging in the email queues because we have other um, technical tickets that take a longer time to respond to. So in early 2015, I actually floated the idea of using live chat on our website to the team, and we decided to give it um, a test run. The problem was that we did not pick the right place to put it. And two, right around the time, um, some team members had to be off for some family reasons. So our team size got drastically reduced. And then we had a technical outage. So <laughs> the whole experiment took all of two days. And we had to <laughs> put it out. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's something that I've always been interested in because I am the type of... Um, customer who would go to the health center and then chat with live chat. It very rarely occurs to me to call, to call a company. And I realized that for a lot of our users, especially with the kind of product we have, seeing is believing. So I can talk to you about uploading a publication or I can show you while you're chatting with me and 
wait while you actually upload and you can see the benefit. And so for that reason, I've always been a proponent of us getting live chat onto our website. So recently we were talking about different ways to engage with our customers and also improve revenue. And so my suggestion was, hey, how about we provide live chat to prospects, pre-sales questions, questions like, what is the size of a publication that I can upload on the free plan? That is a very simple answer. It's a one word answer, right? And it doesn't need to uh, require an email and you sit there for 24 hours waiting for someone to respond. So that was how I, you know, introduced or reintroduced the idea to my team and our supervisor. So we're still in talks, the supervisor is on board, but the team is still hesitant because they remember the failed experiment. And that's where we are right now. <laughs> <laughs> and Matt, I see you. I see you smiling and, and nodding to some of these points here. Um, what what in some of those anecdotes resonates with you in terms of trying to get uh, teams on board with chat or even get chat rolled out onto a site? Any any battle stories you want to share or opinion? Uh, there, yeah, there's a lot there that's very familiar to me. But I think I think you raised a really good point that certain types of questions are really well suited to to the chat, like that instantaneous answer, because it's frustrating and you know. Oh, this is an email and a queue and you get it to it and it's three hours old and it really was just a super easy one Things like that. We didn't need to wait that long to answer that question if we had been able to see it, but just the nature of email is a little different. So live chat is really good for that. But you're also right that um, I've had those experiments before where we turned on chat uh, in previous team and just be became overwhelming instantly or something else happens at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing kind of explodes for a bit and you frantically turn it off again. And then you've just made it really difficult to try and roll that out later because everyone has the like instinctive reaction of like, Ooh, that was a bad day, right? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I feel, I feel that. So uh, and we'll, I think we'll get into this a little bit more, but how, how you can then go back and roll it out in a more controlled way. Yeah. Uh, some of these questions come out here as well. Like, yeah, let's, let's dive in with that. Yeah. I, I, um, so it was Adam, I think who posed this first question. I think it fits nicely with what we're talking about now. So, I mean, how do you scale live chat, especially if you have a small team, we hear from a lot of small business users here, you know, it's, it's just me. I'm uh, answering the phones. I'm responding to emails. Maybe they're doing it in their physical store. So they're actually talking to customers in real life. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, where do you start? How do you scale and make it so that it's not overwhelming in the beginning, but it's still showing a return on the investment that you've made in that tool? Matt, do you want to you want to try that one? Yeah, I, I think the the key thing you want to do is figure out like where is chat most valuable? What kind of questions are really well suited? Because if you're anything like in my experience, there are some questions that are really on chat is just going to be super hard to handle. Like if there's technical details where you're passing back and forth files or you've got, uh, you know, you've got to really dig in or it's, it takes one person doing a whole bunch of work to come back with an answer and then another question and then work again. Chat, it's not a good experience for that. Uh, email is so much better suited for it, but there are certain types of questions uh, where chat is going to be really helpful and will resolve that so quickly. Um, so if you can find a way to identify those kinds of questions and put the chat in the places where those questions are more likely to come up. You can help yourself control the kind of type of questions that you have. Uh, and then I think you've got the problem of controlling the volume as well. Um, so at uh, Campaign Monitor, what we did was put the chat not in the public marketing website, we put it inside the application so that you had to be logged in. So we already are reducing that po total possible number. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we put it deliberately onto the contact page. So when you got to the contact page at that point, we'd either show you the email form or the email form and the live chat option. And we would dynamically change that according to how many people we actually had. So if we can't offer you a good chat experience now, if it's going to be really slow, we'll just hide it completely and it falls back to email directly. Uh, and so we had a lot of, a lot more control then over making sure we only offer chat when we can give you a really good chat experience. I'll add to that too, Adam. I think um, we've seen some users who maybe uh, roll it out on their entire site to start, maybe for a week or two, uh, get a sense of how heavy that fire hose of information is going to be, uh, and then turn it off and evaluate your data. So look at look specifically at your, your transcripts and try to figure out which pages on your site are generating the most chats, because that may indicate that that's where your customers are either having an issue or a challenge or they, they need the most help there. 
And then we, we find it surprising. A lot of people don't understand or don't expect um, chat platforms to let you only roll it out on one page. But you can go back and prune your chat implementation down to that one page that's causing the most frustration for customers. And so thereby, you know, eliminate maybe some of those general questions on your homepage, like when are you open or what is there a sale and just um, offer chat at those stickiest moments so that the customer experience uh, is a little bit better for something that might require more explanation, more nuanced explanation. Um, and then and Matt, you mentioned, you know, also just getting a plan together before it goes onto the site, thinking through a little bit. Denise, when we were talking yesterday, I think that's a big part of what your plan is right now. How do you, what sort of things are you, we going to measure when we roll this out or what, what defines success for chat? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what you've, maybe some of the initial indicators you're going to start looking at? Yeah. So specifically, we will be, just like you and Matt just said, we will be uh, rolling out live chat on our pricing page to catch the pre-sales questions because those are simplest um, and we want to reduce that kind of user confusion way ahead of time so that they're not sitting um, in the queues. Um, we love our customers and we love new customers. We don't want the new customers to think that we're not being respect receptive to them, especially when they're very simple questions, right? So the focus is going to be on the pricing page and what we want to affect is the funnel. So how many people are hitting that page? How many of those are signing up for the free trial? And out of those, how many are going and upselling to become actual paying customers? So that is what we're going to be looking at. And I will be working with a product owner in charge of that feature so that we sit down and talk about what is a reasonable expectation, right? And so we will be measuring that. I'm not going to try and solve any other uh, problems we have in support with that. But we want to help revenue while at the same time also providing a better experience for our pre-sales um, customers. So that's what we're going to be looking at. And apart from that, we're going to look at general support, productivity, and efficiency, right? How long does it take us to respond to a chat? How many chats can a team member handle productively without affecting CSAT? What is CSAT, customer satisfaction on chat, and how does it compare to email? What does our email volume look like in the hours that we're providing live chat? Is this something that we can keep going? And again, we're gonna run this as an experiment, hopefully longer than two days this time, <laughs> planning for a month so that we can actually dig into the information and say, okay, is this something we can do long-term? And if it is, do we just keep it on this one page or do we want to go to another page where we have tickets that could also be answered? I mean, I'm already thinking about what we call our publisher homepage, where sometimes our publishers are stuck as to how to use a particular feature versus not. These are not technical questions. These are more, I want to add links to my publication. How do I do that? We can you know, show them right um, in context in our app. So those are some of the measurements I'm thinking about. Yeah. Um, Emily, I know you had a question about global teams. We're going to come to that in just a second. There was a second part of Adam's question that I think is important and, and we can probably talk to a little bit here and that's he's, he's, he's specific about smaller teams. And I think the concern there uh, when we talk to smaller teams is how much time is this going to take for a team member? Should I have someone solely dedicated to chat or should I have them multitasking? I mean, Matt, in your experience, have you tried it different ways? What's worked best? What's worked worst? Um, especially for those small teams. Yeah, it, it can be, it can be quite demanding. Um, I can I think about it like a scale, like on one end of the scale, you, I'm out of the frame, one end of the scale, you have uh, email, which is really easy to scale because it, they can just sit in a queue, right? And nobody really knows where they are in that queue and there's no sense and you can kind of pick and choose according to how you prioritize them. Uh, and at the other end, there's a phone call where the phone comes in and people expect that to be answered now. Um, and chat is a nice in-between option where you have not, the, not exact, exactly the same instantaneous expectations, um, but you can, you can probably chat to two people at once and they don't need to, you know, the customer doesn't need to know because you, there's so much stuff which is involving waiting anyway, mm -hmm. uh, little bits and pieces. You can swap back and forth and do a couple of chats at a time or three. Um, that was something I didn't experiment with with campaign monitor team, like with our kinds of questions, how many chats could I do at the same time? Um, and it turned out to be between two and three. And after that, I felt like I'm giving people a bad experience now because I'm too distracted about trying to think about three different things at once. Um, but with one at a time, there's just big gaps where I'm waiting for the customer to come back with something. And so I can be helping someone else there. Okay. So yeah, I, I think you've got to know your own audience and you have to know the types of questions that you're going to be answering before you can really figure it out. Um, and 
and maybe we can talk about this too, but like the, how long do you have one person handling chat for? Can you have it at certain hours where you know, or, or after events, like if you have big product pushes and changes to a product, then maybe live chat is really helpful then because you have a whole bunch of questions for a limited amount of time that you can really get through and then you can take it away. So I think you'd be careful about how you present it and how you yeah. advertise that. Like, is this a permanent thing or is this a temporary thing that we're offering now? Sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think staying in touch with your team is, is important. Like you're saying, like it can be intense. Um, uh, for someone like myself, I'm a, I'm a bit of a snowflake when it comes to support. And so a five hour shift means I need to go and be away from my computer as soon as it's done, maybe have a stiff drink after that. Um, mm -hmm. But for other people, they can, they rock and roll on that five days a week. Um, they eat it for breakfast. And um, I think experimentation then with, with that helps. I've talked to some of our users who do two hours on live chat and one hour going through and just doing kind of cleanup from that. So going in and tagging cases or making sure the conversations are organized in such a way that if there's actionable data, then people can act on it afterwards. And then the rest of the time is, is dedicated to the other support channels. Um, but that's a system that person set up after, you know, a few years of doing live chat and figuring out what works best for, for his team. So um, it's, it's, it's a bit of experimentation to find the right blend, I would say. And I want to chime in and say also that if you have a small team, it's fine to know your limits and it's fine not to be available on live chat 24 seven. Just set the expectations up front. So when we are rolling out this uh, our live chat on the pricing page, what, we, what we've done, and I spoke to a member of our analytics team, is to figure out when do we have the most traffic on those pages. We will offer live chat only at those times to catch the most people. So we know that we're making the most impact on that uh, conversion number. So it's fine to only be available for a short amount of time. Just don't be, don't, don't just have the chat bubble there and not give them a follow up or another way to get in touch with you. But it's yeah. fine to say we only provide live chat between this time and this time, Monday to Friday, blah, blah, blah. For other times, contact us in email or whatever it is. So people understand. I think the problem is when you set the expectation that you're there all the time and you cannot manage that and that you know provides a bad experience. So that's one of the things I'll say if you're on a smaller team. Understand that you're going to be limited. I mean, you cannot manufacture or clone your team members. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we all would love to do that. Okay. So just pick a time and you know be maximum, uh, maximum uh, coverage, be effective in those times and then your customers are going to understand that this is when I can get them. And if I can't, they are available via email or social media or however else. And that way you keep your sanity, you keep your team productive, uh, prevent them from burning out. And you're also able to provide a good live chat experience. Excellent. Yeah. Well said. Denise, I'll stick with you because uh, <laughs> the next question is about uh, to support teams who might be in different time zones than your actual customer base. And so it sounds like you have a distributed yeah. team. Um, have you given any thought to how the chat, how you're going to offer chat if you've got team members who are in different, a different time zone than where your customers might live? I am wrestling with that quite a bit right now. Um, we receive about 60% of our email questions when the US is open. So that is quite a huge volume. However, because issues started in Denmark, we have a pretty substantial portion of customers who are in Europe as well. So one of the things that we did, as I mentioned, was to look at what is the traffic that comes to um, the pricing page um, on different hours. And we were able to identify different hour, hourly sections where we can offer live chat. So what we're going to do is just test that theory out. We'll have um, the Denmark team provide live chat in those hours that we identified when they are open. And we will have basically me and probably my manager <laughs> also help with live chat on, yeah, we're going to get all the product owners on board too, especially the product owner in charge of that feature, because we all want to understand um, what impact if any this might have on helping us generate revenue and providing a good service. So that's one of the things you can think of. If you have the um, option of getting other team members who are not support, uh, to help with this, this might also be something that you could do where you could do some sort of paired support programming so that someone who's in a different time zone could cover certain hours. Or like I said, you really could just not provide life at that time, just because I think it's better to provide good email service and 
than it is to provide bad life chat. Yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, Matt, your thoughts on that? Yes, yeah, absolutely agreeing that some, some people you're gonna look at live chat and say, I just can't do this in an effective way now, or I can only do it in certain, you know, for a few hours a day. I think that's totally fine. Um, in terms of international coverage, uh, yeah, it's, it's tricky. You've, got, you've probably got the statistics, as you say, Denise, to, to look at like where the traffic comes in and maybe you can pick a time slot that covers you know, the key hours of end of the European day and the middle of the US day and mm -hmm. that will give you like maximum bang for the amount of people that you have actually have. Like you can't just create people uh, to, I mean, I've created people, but it's very <laughs> I've still got another 15 years before yeah. I could do anything useful. Those, those little people aren't legal to work on. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, <laughs> enough, so yeah. <laughs> uh, my son did tweet once for the company accidentally. <laughs> oh boy, social media, here we go. I wouldn't recommend that option. Um, <laughs> but you, you can, like what we do, once you have a super sufficiently large team, you can do really nice like handoffs between this person covers these hours and we have a, a crossover at the busiest period. So we have two people handling chat and then we roll into the next period where it's quieter and we just have one person who can be monitoring. Um, because of, for a lot of, lot of the time for Campaign Monitor, there were hours where we didn't really get any chat support. Like it just wasn't, because we restricted the amount of people who saw it, it was pretty quiet and that person could be working on, on email conversations and then just be there monitoring the support, the, the live chat uh, option. So I think you can do it. You can, you can restrict it uh, as much as you like, really, to make it a manageable amount. Uh, and then the people who do, you do talk to get a great experience. Sure. You might also, uh, I mean, the job listing may also just specify that it's going to be an off hour um, shift, you know? I mean, yeah. maybe you find a night bird who likes to, yeah. um, who will stay up and in, in if they're in Europe, they like to work through the US hours or something like that. Um, yeah, but there's, there's, there's ways. Um, so we had a question, uh, Jay Schwab had a question here, um, and uh, it's an interesting one. Um, and Matt, I'll give it to you first here. And, and it, it's, it, so he says, but this person says, uh, it seems like if a person's actual first name pops up, uh, then you usually get a better response, right? So we're talking about chat and we say, oh, it's Matt. I love talking to Matt on chat. Um, you know, this is a good thing. But if you have multiple Matts on your team, uh, then it gets a little tricky to use the first name and maybe Matt one sounds a little less human than <laughs> Matt, right? I, have you ever come across that? And do you have any ideas on what a solution for uh, maintaining customization or personalization on like a large team might look like? Yeah, so, to, and maybe we can get clarification on that question. I feel like, just to be clear, with most chat solutions, like with Olark, you have separate logins for each customer service person, right? So they do come up as an individual person when they're applying to customers. So they don't just have to see like, oh, it's, you know, Olark person replying to me, it's, it's Matt. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and because you're right, like having that human connection, that's a big benefit of chat is to have, at least as a person that I'm talking to, I don't know about, uh, probably Denise, you get this a lot as well, but people who think that when they reply to email that it's not a human, like they like yeah. to say, I want to talk to a real person. Yeah. Uh, a real live human. <laughs> I do feel like saying, you know, that they're all still real people. But, <laughs> but what they're trying to say is like, I like to have a conversation with a person. I don't want to feel like I'm writing an essay and then getting, getting my essay marked and returned to me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, how, how do you put a little bit of that in? I think you have to be careful, to be honest, with chat, because uh, especially if you're, um, there are some people who would just get on chat just to cause trouble. So you don't necessarily want to be too personal and give out too much information, but having a name, trying to have a little avatar or a, a photo, even if it's not necessarily you, you know, some people want to protect themselves, understandably. But um, yeah, getting, getting a bit of personality in there and signing it off with your name. If you can't do anything else, signing it off with your name or introducing yourself in the chat with like, hey, I'm Matt, I'm here to help you with this. I think that those all things will, will make a difference and make people feel more like, oh, here is a real person who's trying to help me. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you could do that too with your avatar. I mean, maybe Matt one talks to Matt two and says like, I'm gonna have a yellow hat on in my avatar. You do something else that's like easy to visually grab a hold of. Um, that could be another solution. Um, I'm I Matt with one T as well, so. I'm already special. Yeah, I'm Carl with a K, so I'm special. <laughs> All right. Um, well, Denise, how about, you t how about this follow-up question from Jay Schwab? 
um, and, and they ask, so they try to get people to call or email as soon as the chat starts. Sometimes the chats can get really long, which yeah, yeah sometimes they can. Um, you know, I've, I've been on some that have, that have taken quite a bit of time to get resolution. Um, do you, what are your thoughts on trying to move someone from a chat channel to another channel like phone or email, either, either instantly or after a little bit of a while, if it seems like it's taking a long time? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question because that's one of the things that I included when I'm thinking about training uh, the team to respond to live chats. I think one of the ways you could approach it is to set a limit, right? If the conversation is such that you need to do a bit more digging or you want to get more information, then you say, hey, if after two minutes or, you know, three follow-up questions, this seems like it's going to go say, hey, you know what? I may need to get some more information from you. Can you give me a call on this number? Or can you um, send me an email? And that way we have that paper trail and I can refer to it and give you some more detailed information. When if you position it as I want to be able to get as much information as possible to you so you can achieve whatever goal it is you need, most people are receptive to sending them to a different channel. Um, I think if you do it instantly, it might seem like you do not want to talk to them. <laughs> so you may want to um, just basically based on the kind of question they're asking and the tone that would um, um, allow you to figure out the best way. But I think having a rule of thumb, hey, if I'm having two or three questions and it seems like they need a bit more hand holding, and I think I can do that with a call or with an email where I can send them screenshots or things like that, then you would move them um, to the different channel. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just looking back through some of our conversation here too. I know Darren, you weighed in and said that you're going solo with your business, which congratulations, good luck with that. Yeah. Um, but you said you can't always answer the phone, but you can chat for more on-demand responses. And I think, you know, we've talked a little bit about chat limits. You can do a little bit more multitasking with chat than you can on the phone. Um, and maybe you reserve the phone for some of those just really sticky, um, customer requests that, uh, so, you know, cause sometimes you either your fingers get tired or the small mm -hmm. screen or like, it just is easier to talk somebody through it. So, yeah. you know, it's like you said, Denise, kind of feeling out the customer's uh, comfort level with that. Um, and, and how willing they are yeah. to switch channels, I think is, is important. And so you'll figure it out over time. And sometimes you can ask them, Hey, um, you seem, this seems like, uh, it's, uh, it's a really important point for you. Would you be comfortable with us moving this to a phone call so I can better explain it to you? And also following up, right? If you say you're gonna call them, give them a time when you're gonna call and call. <laughs> yeah. So that you set that expectation. And that's, and that's, that's good, yeah. That's a good point, actually. So Aaron and Mary, before I get to your questions, Matt, you know, moving someone, moving a particularly challenging conversation from chat to another channel, any, I mean, you have, you, I'm sure you have some experience with this. Is there anything that you like to do to move that conversation? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that channel transition, yeah, it can be really tricky. Uh, so let's, on the assumption that you, because my, my personal feeling is if they want to talk to me in chat, I will stick with chat as long as it's useful. But yeah, there are times when it, it doesn't make sense. Um, so I think when you do the transition, as Denise said, like asking is good, um, but then, just do as much work as you can yourself. Like don't put that onto the customer. So if you're saying, you know, I want to move it to email, I'm not going to ask that customer, Hey, can you email me and then repeat yeah. all the stuff that you just said to me so that I have it in a ticket. It's like, I've created an email. I'm going to email it to you. You reply to me when you're ready. And then we will follow it up from there. Same with phone call. Like, uh, you know, if you, if you want to share with me or if I've already got your records, like if I can connect that in my back end CRM and figure out who you are and what you need and, Say, look, I'm happy to call you. I've got your details. You just tell me, is this number fine? And when, when's the best time for me to call you? Mm -hmm. I think you take on as much work as you can of the transition. You make it as smooth as possible as you can. And then they're more likely to agree to. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's talk about, um, talk briefly about canned responses. This is Mary's question. And then Aaron, I'm going to come back to your question because I feel like maybe that's a good point for us to end on. Um, but Mary asks, uh, what role do canned responses play in live chat? So, um, I mean, on one hand, you've got efficiency, right? So having some preset answers is, is helpful for your team. On the other hand, there's also a uh, marketing consistency or even just consistency within your messaging. So either signing on the same way or signing off the same way or understanding that there's a special sale that's happening. So all of your operators can uh, respond in a similar manner. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Matt, has, what, what do you feel like the role of canned responses is um, when it comes to uh, instant channel like chat? Uh, I think you can use them. I think you have to be careful because the canned responses you might use in email, we can be quite lengthy. They can go into a lot of detail. Mm -hmm. And if you try and do that in a chat, it's so obvious that you're just pasting in a whole bunch of stuff. Right? <laughs> it just goes nothing, nothing, nothing. Blah, blah. Uh, I think if you're going to use them in, in live chat, you're going to break it up into much smaller pieces. You tie that in with your natural language conversation. So it's useful for like, here's a little snippet of how to do this task or here, is this, here are some URLs that are useful for this particular conversation. And so yeah. I'll have my conversation then I'll ping in just a little bit, maybe using something like a text expander. So I'm just getting just tiny snippets and not big chunks. Yeah. Uh, you can still save yourself a lot of time. And if you do it right, like any kind of canned response, if you write these well and you keep them updated and you, uh, tweak them for each person as you use them. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares that it's a canned response because it's just it's answering the question for them. Yeah. Denise, what do you think? I am in perfect agreement. I love canned responses, but you don't. I mean, the live chat window is tiny, um, and when you want immediate response, imagine if you were calling someone because most people see live chat as a proxy for phone call. Imagine that you call someone asking them a question, and you can hear them going. Well, first you do this and you do that. You know that they're reading a paragraph to you. It doesn't sound like a conversation. I mean, they might as well just send the email or go into uh, your knowledge base. So, you know, breaking them into little pieces that are digestible, as Matt said, and even then following up and saying, okay, so this is what I shared with you. Does this make sense so far? Are you with me? Um, that's also helpful so that even if you are using a kind response, the point is to get them to understand, get them to be successful at whatever they're trying to achieve. So check in with them and you have that option, right? Um, because they're there with you in, immediately. Um, I love kind responses. I think you can use them in live chat um, with some modifications and just try to sound like you're having a conversation with them because that's really what it is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a, there are a lot more platforms that offer those bots and automated responses on them now. And uh, customer, we see customers even come on the chat with us and they're trying to like give us automated responses, <laughs> like think, <laughs> like an, an automated thing. And, and so we say like, hi, how, even something as simple as like, hi, how are you today? They're like, are you a robot? And <laughs> I'm absolutely not a robot. I've played travel kickball in the past or something, right? Then you, you're trying to come up with the most zany thing you can to prove you're a real human. Um, so I think you do have, you have to be a little bit careful because the expectation of, of automated responses is growing and you don't want to, um, you have to fight against that, that <laughs> thought that's kind of taking it. So, uh, good question, Mary. Thanks for that. Okay. Aaron wants to talk about outbound chats, pre-sale outbound chats. So someone comes onto your site, they're browsing. A lot of chat browsers will be able to show you that there are in fact visitors on your site and allow you to reach out to them either through an automated rule or by an operator actually proactively clicking on them and starting a conversation with them. On one hand, I think in one camp, you have some people who say that's a bit creepy. On the other hand, you've got some people who say like, I need to increase my sales. I don't care if they think it's creepy. Um, and somewhere in between is the, the proper etiquette of actually like reaching out to a customer who's not expecting to hear from you, but then the chat bubble, the chat bubble pops and there's a, something in it. So, um, I, I'm going to, this is a toss up. So who wants to grab this one first um, and offer your either best practices for it, or maybe even just the uh, thoughts on the subject. I'll go. <laughs> um, the ones that I've seen that did not get on my nerves um, were very obviously bots, but all they said was, Hey, we are here if you need help. So there was no push to purchase something or push to take a particular action. It was just saying, hey, hey, you know, you seem to be coming back and forth here. If you need help, we're here to help. And then giving the customer the option to close it if they don't need it. And if the customer has closed it within that session, do not pop it back again. So having that kind of logic in the background, I think, will make it the experience less um, annoying and intrusive because sometimes there are people who like I before I purchase anything I do a lot of research and I will come and I will read all the articles and I may not talk to someone until I'm very close to purchase so if at every visit you're popping up I'm gonna get I'm gonna get a little exasperated so um, give giving them that nudge and saying hey we're here if you have some questions but also giving them the option to not contact you because that's also their prerogative that's I think that that's a good in between for anyone who wants to use that um, kind of automation. Matt, 
Start. Yes. Yep. No, I, I agree. I think Denise has covered most of it there, but I think um, that it depends again on your audience. Certain types of products, like as a kind of, a, I was a web designer and a kind of tech person in my past life, and I basically never want anyone to try and chat to me ever. <laughs> Just my personal thing, and so I have that instinctive reaction <laughs> to, to things on websites, but. As I was at Campaign Monitor, as we became more of a, you know, selling to marketers, realizing they, those people, they're different people and they want to talk all the time. And so they're more than happy to. And so understanding what your audience actually wants and like the people who are coming to the site, they may or may not be, or some percentage of them are going to be happy to talk. So I think, you know, getting past your own personal feelings either way about whether it's good or bad is probably good and understanding what your actual customer base does. Perfect thing for an experiment, right? Just try it, see what happens. And then thinking about where do you want to do that? Um, especially talk to your support, to your kind of support team. Even though we're talking about outbound sales, the support people, especially in small companies, will often know like the questions people have when they're on the marketing site are these kinds of things. And so you can probably target certain pages, like the pricing page, the classic page where people probably have tons of questions. And if you don't answer it right then, or if you don't offer to answer it right then, they may never come back to that. So picking the right page and the right opportunity to like, you only get really one chance to ask them and until it becomes really annoying. Mm. And so pick the time where it's going to be most valuable to try and talk to people and then see what happens. Yeah. 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 That's an interesting point. I mean, gauging the comfort level of your customers is one thing. So maybe you have customers browsing who aren't necessarily extroverts or don't really want to talk through that much stuff, but um, gauging the comfort level of your own team is important too, because they're ultimately, then you're forcing them into sales conversations they might not be comfortable with, or you're asking them to, especially with an automated rule, yeah. they might not even know that you applied that rule. And all of a sudden they're getting an influx of conversations about a particular topic that, they're kind of like, I don't understand why everybody wants to talk to me about X. And also they want, I can't, I don't want to sell people on X. And so, you know, um, so I think that's a, you need to be aligned internally as well as, as externally. It's important. Um, and we have, we have some agencies who will implement our technology as sort of a, uh, as a package for their clients, like that web design company might add a chat widget, right? And we've seen some of those agencies come back to us with like interesting experiments that they run um, where they'll say, well, we tried uh, two weeks of doing a, an automated greeter that wasn't even like relevant to our website just to see what, like, what the response rate would be. Um, and in some cases you see a lift from it, right? So they, this one experiment was like a one out of three, uh, one out of every three chatters actually stopped when they were, on their design website, they were offering a greeter that said like, what's your best tips for marriage? And somebody would actually stop and engage with that. Now, whether that, what, you know, when it's, <laughs> when it's an experiment, it's a little bit zany and maybe they're just doing it to, to get a sense of what's out there and you might not want to take as many risks with your own business. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I think we've referenced this a couple of times here now, like, you know, trying a controlled experiment for a short period of time might yield something new that you hadn't thought of before. And, and sometimes it's good to take a risk like that. You might, you might uncover something new. So um, we're getting close to the end of our session here. Um, I just want to say real quick before, if people need to run, Matt and Denise, do you want to give your, either your email address or a Twitter handle? People could reach out to you if they want to ask you follow-up questions. Um, you can leave it in the chat or you can mention it, mention it verbally if you want. Sure. My Twitter handle is my um, Ghanaian name, so it's a little difficult to <laughs> for people to pronounce. I've typed that um, in there. And you can reach me at dt at issue.com, dt at issuu.com, or denise at issue.com will also come to me. I'm the only one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Matt? Yeah. So, yes, you can uh, on Twitter. I'm at Mr. Pato, very Australian, M R P A T T O, or just email me, Matt with one T at helpscout.com. Very good. And I'm Carl, K A R L, at olark.com. Uh, I have first and last name. I have a Polish last name, so my Twitter handle is kind of long, but it's at Carl Polowitz. Um, I'll post it in chat if you ever want to. Um, chat more talk more about these topics here please feel free to reach out to any of us we're happy to help or more than happy willing to answer questions I know there was a couple look like maybe product specific questions uh, we'll make sure we can get to those 
on email. Uh, Aaron actually had a good follow-up question here, so we'll, we'll keep the conversation going for another minute or two. How important do you think the feedback option is on chat after every conversation? Do you, have you gone through and what actionable data have you been able to pull out of post-chat surveys um, and how have, how have you used that or um, fed that back into your team to make them better? I found that people were much more uh, frequently would actually answer the feedback in a live chat than they would with the email. Um, so we got many more responses. Um, and I found it, it was quite helpful to measure like what's the relative level of happiness of people who've just had a chat versus people who had an email interaction. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I found that a campaign monitor that live chat customers were really happy, basically. <laughs> uh, I think mostly from what I can tell, it's mostly to do with the speed, right? They get the answer that they want when they want it and yeah. they don't have to wait. Yeah. I, as a customer, am yet to give a live chat um, agent a bad rating. <laughs> Even if they give me the answer, they, they don't give me the answer I'm expecting. The fact that they were there, they're responsive and they, I mean, I understand being in customer support that sometimes there are policies that you may be working hard to change, but until it's changed, you have to, you're responsible for applying them um, for certain decisions. And so it's not the agent's fault, but the fact that they were responsive and they answered my questions honestly and as fast as they can, I will give them that feedback rating. But also additionally, if you don't know how you're doing, how do you know whether to keep doing what you're doing to improve it or to roll it back? So um, that, that feedback is one of the ways. We talked about the stats and the measurements that you take. So that is one kind of input and the feedback from the customer is another input. So let's say you're measuring time to first response on chat and you're measuring you know conversions but customers are saying oh my god this is terrible this sucks I hate I hate your company because the agents are bad or this agent tells me this and then you go into the chat and you realize that something egregious is happening with um, that particular agent um, this is useful information for you so you can tweak your processes so you can improve and you can get better and even if it's not improving and getting better sometimes if it's good feedback you know oh this is great let's keep doing that you know let's keep um, on that same path because we have a good thing going. So that's what that feedback is useful for. So yes, I definitely think that you should have that uh, after every conversation. Again, the prerogative is for the customer. They can choose to answer it or not, and it should not be a deal breaker. You cannot exit this chat if you do not rate, <laughs> you yeah. know. But having that option is good information for you so you can always be improving and, and making sure that this channel that you've rolled out is actually serving the purpose for which you installed it. Love it. So Denise, Matt, I want, you have 30 seconds, parting <laughs> shots. Uh, Denise, what, what kind of, what wisdom do you impart on us before we go out into the wild blue chat, uh, chat yonder? I've recently been into the whys. Before you do anything, ask yourself why. Why am I doing this and what do I expect to get out of it? So if you're going to launch live chat, understand very clearly why you're doing it, um, how you're going to measure it, and what that success will look like before you roll it out. Because if not, you may end up doing a half-baked live chat rollout that will actually adversely impact the team and customers. Awesome. Matt? Yep, I, I want to second that. Absolutely understand why you're trying to do it. Um, and I did want to acknowledge that I had this experience. I think it's really common that if you're leading a team of support people, that starting a new support channel can be like pretty intense, a little bit scary. You worry about stretching your team too far or that you're going to break something that's working in order to add something else. So um, just reassuring people that you can, you can roll this out like in a control way. You can be, do it carefully. You can understand the impacts early, but that live chat is the benefits of it. You will see it so quickly. The benefit of having that um, real time interaction for certain types of conversations, it can be super helpful and it can really improve that customer's experience. So uh, definitely give it a try. Yeah, awesome. I'll, my only parting thought would be, um, you know, it's a channel where you're still separated by a screen from the customer you're talking to, the business and the customer, but it's still a human immediate interaction. And so it's while you're looking at your data and you're making sure you're analyzing um, certain things to make sure that you're, you're getting into where it needs to be. And uh, as the volume starts to go up, remember to try to just remain as human as possible. Um, it's going to be that human authentic interaction that really keeps customers coming back. Um, and it takes a little bit more effort to keep things human, but in the long run, it'll pay off um, and your customers will appreciate it. So remember to, 
remember to stay human, everybody. Um, I'm going to leave this channel open for a little bit longer, but I think we've pretty much covered everything we wanted to. Uh, if there are any last minute questions, you can, uh, if you ask them in chat, we'll probably just follow up on email uh, at this point. Cause I know Matt and Denise, you probably got other more important things to get back to, but I want to say thank you. Uh, thanks to everybody who joined us today. Um, awesome questions from our group. Um, and Matt and Denise, thank you so much for just sharing, you know, sharing all this stuff. I think this is going to be really helpful for everybody who either saw it today or comes back and watches it at a later point. So, uh, to everyone out there, good luck, take care. Um, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Maybe we'll do this again sometime. So take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>